This is Comic Shenanigans episode 1033, a conversation with Chuck Austin and Pat Olive. Welcome to the Comic Shenanigans Podcast. This is episode 1033. It's yet another conversation with Chuck Austin and Pat Olive. Uh, so I just got Chuck and Pat back on the show. It's funny, when we first scheduled this podcast uh, interview, it was actually to talk about the upcoming release of Edgeworld uh, Season 2, uh, Trade Paperback. Uh, it was originally a Comixology for exclu- first exclusive, uh, but now it's in, in physical print. So I was excited to talk with uh, these wonderful gentlemen to talk about their book. Um, but as luck would have it, the week before we were set to record, record, um, an announcement hit that they had a new series coming out, um, which not only was it coming out, but it was literally having the first issue on the day we were supposed to record, which is March 19th. Now, originally, I had anticipated this episode going up a few days uh, after that. Um, It ended up going up a lot later. We usually go up on Saturdays, at least we try to. Um, So this is a little late going up. So I do apologize to Chuck and to Pat for not having this up a little bit more promptly. Um, But we got to talk about their new book, The Tormented, and we actually do a pretty fairly deep dive into the first issue. So, if, you know, in, on the one hand, if you haven't read it, uh, you know, I don't want to don't listen to this, but, it, you know, there's some slight spoilers, but we don't go too deep into spoilers for the most part. I think there was one moment where we do kind of go a little deeper into spoilers. Um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was great having both of them on. Uh, they're a great collaborative team. I just have to mention, there's a little bit of an audio issue on Chuck's end for whatever reason when he would talk. Um, there was a background noise. It was harder to, harder to kind of filter it out. So uh, I think at one point in the podcast, we kind of mentioned it, um, like, oh, you know, can we try and fix the audio? It doesn't really, get, unfortunately, get much better from that point. Um, but Pat's super clear. Um, so at times, it's a little hard to hear what Chuck's saying. But, it's, uh, you know, it's still valuable what he has to say. Um, and it's great to be able to talk to both. Both Pat and Chuck, because obviously they come at the project together, but they do have their own lanes uh, in terms of what they kind of bring to the project that's unique. Um, so it was really fun to be able to talk with them about that. I'm hoping to speak with Pat again soon to talk about his recent work on uh, my probably the title that I love the name on the most, which is the Marvel Superhero Secret Wars Battle World. I think that's the entire title. Uh, coming up with the acronym when I was kind of writing it out to someone, I was like, this looks ridiculous. <laughs> like so many letters put together. Uh, but it's a fantastic book that Chuck worked on. Sorry, not Chuck. Uh, Pat uh, drew and it was a lot of fun to read. So I'm excited to talk to him at some point about that as well. Because um, we talked about the first issue a few months ago in the, the last time uh, that I had uh, Pat and Chuck on. Um, if you do want to check out the um, back catalog, you can see previous episodes uh, with Pat and with Chuck. Uh, Pat was on episode 1016. Uh, he was also on episode, oh my goodness, uh, 810, uh, 450, 278, as well as 450, sorry, 850 with, uh, with Chuck. Uh, that was when we did a commentary on Edgeworld season one. That was about three years ago. Uh, if you want to check out episodes that had just Chuck on his own, uh, obviously he did that episode with Pat. Um, and then he did one kind of solo episode I did with him, uh, which would have been episode 814, uh, which is from October 2020. So nice to have uh, both these gentlemen back on uh, to talk about their wares. Um, it's a really interesting and uh, tense new book, uh, but I definitely enjoyed reading the first issue, and I think you will too. Uh, you can email us at comicshenanigans at gmail.com, rate and review the show on iTunes, subscribe to, uh, to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever it's called. You can also listen to us on Spotify. Before I let you go, just a quick glimpse into the future uh we've got some good stuff coming up we've got uh another book of the month club episode where we look at the first i think it's going to be about the first three months of the uh, infamous 90s spider-man clone saga really excited to talk about that i think specifically we're just going to be talking about power and responsibility uh that four-parter as well as i guess what the birth of a clone i can't remember the exact name but whatever the flip book was called uh during those issues uh, as well as talking about the exile returns and back from the edge so i'm really excited to hear uh my guests uh in terms Interpretation and feelings on these particular issues uh, and how we differ. And I think there will be some differentiation here, so differentiation in terms of our opinions. So I'm excited to, uh, to hear what they have to say about it. Uh, upcoming episodes past that, uh, we have a colorist, uh, sorry, a letterer coming on soon 
from uh, her name is Ariana. She's from the virtual calligraphy studio uh, that is uh, Chris Eliopoulos, uh, Eliopoulos's uh, studio. Uh, he was recently on the show, and so I was able to get in contact with uh, other people in his studio. So I'm excited to interview them. We have Jam DeMatteis is coming back on the show in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have Joe Rubenstein, anchor, coming on as well. Um, I'm actually recording with him in a couple of days. So uh, a lot of good stuff coming uh, down the pipeline. Always uh, trying to get you know more people to come back on the show uh, or come on the show for the first time. So anyways, uh, without further ado, uh, you've listened to me ramble, ramble on long enough. Let's jump right into the episode with Chuck Austin and Pat Off talking about their tormented and a little bit of Edge World. Uh, enjoy. Pat, Chuck, welcome back to the Comic Shenanigans Podcast. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for having us, Adam. Nice yeah, thanks for having us. As we were saying off podcast for a second, uh, this is a momentous day as we speak. It's it's March 19th. It's the day that uh, Edgeworld uh, Season 2 shows up in uh, bookstores in terms of the trade paperback, um, yep. collecting the uh, the last, what, five issues that you guys did. And also you have a new book that right. literally just dropped today um, after being kind of surprised on everyone last week. Uh, in the tormented. So, um, what, what, this is a big day. How do you guys feel? Uh, you feeling good? Yeah, great. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a, it's been a long, uh, process to get here. Um, but to actually have, uh, both of these things happen in the same day is, uh, is fantastic. So, yeah. Excellent. So I have to ask, so now that we know that we have, this new project, which we're going to talk about in a second, which is the Tormented, it does make me view Edge World season two a little differently, only because you left on a cliffhanger and then you go do another book. What does this mean for Edge World? <laughs> yeah, it's basically a mind game. We're screwing you. <laughs> so I have to ask: At what point, like you guys have been working on Edge World, when did, when did this other project kind of start percolating, and how did it end up? kind of being released after season two and then hopefully b- b- before season three. Oh man, that's a complicated story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course Pat is laughing. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I guess without getting too personal about like just life and how things are done. <laughs> um, uh, shit, before he left, Comixology uh, asked Pat and I to do more projects. And we were just going to uh, bounce back and forth between you know, five issues of this and five issues of that. And, uh, and then they, so, you know, we pitched them, threw them a couple ideas. Pat had this this one. This is all, this was Pat's original idea. And uh, we really liked it. We started getting excited about it and we pitched it to Chip. He went crazy and thought it was great. And, and then he pushed it through and then he quit comicsology. <laughs> <laughs> Um, of course, he had a bit, you know, he had a distillery coming up, and he's, he's having a great time with that. So I can't blame him really for going out. But, but you know, that meant hands changed and things changed, and, and Edge World was doing actually pretty well for comicsology. So they asked us to continue to do do that uh, and continue that series at the same time. And so originally, Pat and I were going to work with another artist on Tormented. Oh, really? Have, yeah, somebody else was going to draw the book. We had talked to a couple of people. And, yeah, because the other option at that point was, like, uh, Pat, draw faster. And, yeah. and <laughs> if, you could give up, if you could give up on eating and sleeping, that would be awesome. And I don't think I can do that. No, and does, you know, he didn't want his wife and kid mad at me. Um, so, you know, we had, to, we had to make arrangements for somebody else to draw. Uh, but then the... the Television industry fell apart, and all of a sudden jobs started going away, and there wasn't a lot of work. And so we had to kind of put everything on hiatus because I was paying for some of the time And uh, so we just put it on hold, uh, even though we technically had the orders from Comicsology, we just couldn't afford to make it until I got another job. So uh, we we had got we already finished off. I think Edgeworld season two. And had done one issue of Edge World season three, and everybody got really excited about the Tormented, and wanted us to finish the Tormented and get it finished in time. They were hoping for thank, uh, for Halloween of last year, but there was just nothing that was going on. So every couple of weeks, somebody would check in and ask where it was, where it was, and so 
kind of figured that Tormenti was the one who wanted the next, so we were going to finish that. And, uh, and as soon as we were going to get this, we back on the finishing it. It's easy to is that a short enough answer? Yeah, no, that that, <laughs> that works. So I have, I have some questions because um, reading through the first issue of, of the Tormented, it's first of all hard to imagine anyone but Pat drawing it. So it's hard wow, to imagine that originally you. he wasn't going to. Um, what it struck me, especially looking at Edgeworld and looking at this, we talked before Pat about how in some ways Edgeworld was very freeing because you got to build this world from the ground up, so everything right. was coming out of your mind. And here, this is obviously a more you know, it at least starts much more grounded setting. So yep. what is it like to kind of go from, you know, something that has a grounded feel, but is still a otherworldly and edge world, and then coming to something like this, which is much more grounded, much more serious feeling, and, you know, the stakes feel a lot higher. Everything is, because it's not been as fantastical, at least maybe not yet, um, and more serious and um, more scary, uh, what was right. it like to kind of adjust your tone? Well, I think I think that, and something like a book like Tormented, that's basically kind of a, a paranormal horror kind of book, I think starting from a basis of uh, reality, you know, something that you are, you recognize when you look outside your window, I think that makes the kind of more frightening, paranormal, bizarre things that happen even more so. When you start off with your basis of being a recognizable reality, mm -hmm. whereas in something like Edgeworld, where it was from the get-go, it was a science fiction western, another planet, the whole thing. That was easier to just build from the ground up. But in this, in, in the Tormented, when we're trying to set it in the quote-unquote real world and have these, you know, bizarre things happen, um, I think that makes those instances. Uh, I think that makes them more impactful if you start off with a world that everybody recognizes. Absolutely. That makes that makes a lot of sense. So a question. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to jump around a little bit. So forgive me, guys. Sure. Um, Pat, one of the things, the first things that struck me about one of your characters, um, I believe it was Brad. Um, was there a specific actor or a person in your life that you based that on? Because it seemed like a very specific image. And to be honest, I immediately thought it was a specific actor. But then I was like, I'm really curious what Pat was thinking. Like, who? Well, who was there, the there. So when. um when we, when Chuck and I talked about who Brad would be, and the thing that I love about working with Chuck is that, yeah, so the idea, original idea for this was my idea, but then Chuck then develops these characters in these wonderful ways that, that they have their own personalities and they have their own viewpoints and their own sense of humor and, um, and, you know, working in the industry that he does. I mean, Chuck obviously could be, could pull from different people that he knows to, to, to give Brad his personality. Um, but there were, I have to admit, there were some. It was, Brad is a com, uh, kind of a combination of different. Um, how should I say this? Kind of smarmy looking dudes that I have seen. <laughs> that I have seen. That I have seen either in my life or in movies or TV shows or whatnot. They're just kind of. There are just guys that you know have this kind of, like I said, this smarmy quality that. Um, there wasn't a specific actor or anybody in mind when I uh, created the, the when I came up with the look for this for Brad, um, but he was a kind of a combination of a lot of those guys that um, when you look at them you would describe them as he has a very punchable face. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's kind of where he came from. Okay, um, for for those at home who are wondering who I was thinking of, uh, there's an actor Craig uh, I guess Bierko who was in the TV show called Unreal, and he played a smarmy producer. Oh, I didn't felt, know that. <laughs> and this felt like that guy. And he kind of, he had a similar what? kind of facial structure. I'm like, that feels like it's that guy. I what is, was what's mentioning. the name of it? Um, it's from a TV show called Unreal. Oh, wow. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to find out. Uh, yeah, if he's too close, I'll have to give him a mustache or something. <laughs> <laughs> it, it may have just been me projecting, but when I saw it, I was like, that's the guy. But, oh, um, wow. Okay. But no, he yeah. played no, that, that was... exact kind of archetype. So it's funny. Well, that I'm, I'm sure that. that whoever was producing or directing that show um, had the same mindset that I did. And that just you know, like we need some smarmy, some smarmy dude. And that he worked out for him and Brad worked out for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny because uh, Brad is actually, he's a, a, a fictitious son of a producer that I actually worked for years ago. 
Oh. Um, he's like, because yeah, I gave him aspects of his personality by making him a little less smarmy and devious. So you can just imagine how um, smarmy and devious the original guy was. But yeah, he has a, he has a basis in, in sort of somebody real. But, uh, hmm. Now I'm going to have to check out that real because I've never seen that. <laughs> so uh, I'm always curious, Pat, when it comes to how you kind of cast your characters, because obviously, you know, you have to, you have to draw these characters a lot. And so you have to, yep. you know, get used to their facial expressions, et cetera. There's something really special about how you drew Ryan. I just felt like he felt extremely lived in as a character, if that makes any sense. Like the oh, emotional beats you give him, there's a shot in the first issue where, um, you know, he, he's, it was just after he's been surprised at his house by Brad and, um, him being very like, no, it's not great that you're doing a show about, you know, paranormal yeah. etc and the look of like shock and awe on his face and it's almost like an absent look feels so right so i'm just very curious like how did you go about kind of casting who ryan was going to be for you and how did you really dial into his his his, his visual acting because it's phenomenal well thanks thanks well i think ryan was so my original idea um uh was a more of a father-daughter relationship so ryan essentially uh, and my original idea was uh, obviously uh, a female character, um, but um, but as the story unfolded and as Chuck and I developed it, it became a father son, which I actually like a lot better. Um, and I think that 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 father son kind of relationship is you know, it just has a, it's kind of unique and in into itself, so that lends itself to its own interactions. But in terms of Ryan, you know, once we'd kind of honed in the fact that he would be the, a, a male character, um, I think that um, a part of it was when I would get the script, um, I kind of I kind of had the basis, the leftover basis of how I thought who he was from the original idea. So some of that, uh, some of his characteristics that I kind of had in mind originally, I just kind of moved over to this character, and then it was combined with the conversations Chuck and I had and the, the, uh, the way Chuck developed the character that, um, kind of was informing how I handled it. Now the, there was a, there is an actor. Oh my God. I'm blanking on his name that I kind of went to for like his, like a, a younger guy, uh, for his hairstyle and what he was wearing. And oh my God, I'm blanking on his name. My, my 17 year old daughter would know exactly who this is. But I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember at the moment. Um, but, uh, I think it was just in, in order to get the acting correct, to, to, to correct and to understand the character. Like I said, I think I just brought some, uh, uh, of the characteristics I had thought originally into this character. And then the rest of it comes from Chuck. I mean, that's one of the things that I like working about Chuck, working with Chuck is that, you know, I get these scripts and these characters just kind of come alive. And once you get a character that's fully realized and a character that's acting on the page in the script, it makes it easier for me to have them act on in the panel itself. So the next character I want to ask about is is Opal because again she yeah. feels very fully realized by both of you. So Chuck, wh- how, what was about kind of nailing her speech patterns? Because she feels very like again fully formed. Like she's a you know she's a living breathing character. She doesn't feel like she fits into any kind of stereotypes of a character. She feels like just this this person. And then second after Chuck has given his answer, Pat, I'm curious about your modeling for her. I love the use of the you know her wearing glasses. There's just something about how it frames her face and how the visual um, takes of how she's talking even on the phone. Like it's something that would in theory be a, a static image of just her with a, talking on the phone. But you add a lot to the, the facial expression, so I'm curious about that after Chuck has told us about who Opal is. Sure. Um, it, it's, you know, it's really funny because I, um, Pat will send me sketches of characters and it just starts to spur a personality in my head. And like, he, you know, when we talked about a producer, he sent me Brad and just the way Brad looked, his personality started to evolve out of people. Uh, and, and Opal is actually not somebody that I do know. She's just somebody who's, who's sort of evolved out of that original sketch that And uh, uh, one of the great things that I love about that, all the way back to when we first looked at the call, when we first met, <laughs> is that he, he does this <laughs> acting stuff that just gives the characters that, like you said, there's that, like, that subtle sort of, you know, like the, 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 the glasses, the tilt of the head, 
there's this thing about her that just comes across as like a little shy, a little nice, a little sweet. And then you take the aspects that I wanted to give her. Like she, I keep, and I, it's, it's been so long since we've done the first couple of issues. I can't remember. I think this is in the first issue. She meets Quinn in the first issue, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. When she meets Quinn, and she's just, you know, part of the deal is that she, she doesn't realize that she's seen, she's seen ghosts. She's sublimated this thing for so long, but that instinctual sort of sweetness and mother side of her comes out that she can't help but just be nice and polite to the kid, the people around her, or whoever it is that she's talking to, and that has a basis in the story. So a lot of this, a lot of the character development that goes on in my head comes from what is required by the story. What is necessary for the story is to have a certain aspect in the architecture of each one of these individual characters for something that's coming up in the series. And just the, the drawing of Pat Dave, she just got into that. So it wasn't, it's not really so much an archetype or somebody that she's based on. It's just, and it just had all these compliments man. but I don't honestly I don't know where it's coming from I feel like some kind of <laughs> just they, these characters have these voices and they start to grow and develop and Ryan I never pictured him initially as like this guy with anger management issues but he very quickly he, like I kept drawing uh, writing and flaring up and I thought oh it's really cool if he had anger management stuff and then Pat sent back a drawing where he's flaring up and I thought yeah <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is where it needs to go. So, so some of it is just it's, it's sort of like this involvement that happens. I, I know this is getting really long winded, but I'm remembering it so uh, uh, The uh, that this stuff just kind of it's like Pat and I working off each other. I'll see something that he drew, and he'll see something that I wrote, and we just kind of feed off of each other. And Opal is one of those things that kind of evolved in that same, in that way. Uh, Sahira too. Sahira was kind of yep. Yeah. Yep, and I think um, as far as the, the way she looks and the way she acts, and it, it was, it was. Um, I mean, when you create any story, you need, you know, all the characters have to be distinct and different enough from each other so that they can interact with each other. So when we first start talk, talking about Opal. Um, I mean, she, it was one of those things where reading what Chuck had described and where, where the character was going, um, she just had that feeling of this like sweetness and this kind of almost a bookish kind of a quality. I think the glasses are part, part of, I was trying to get that across. Um, and I think to a certain extent, and, um, Chuck and I, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, I guess, it's kind of strange that, you know, you start off with these characters and, and you have a general idea of where they're going to go, but you're not exactly sure. But then as you draw them and as you write them and um, they almost become themselves on their own in a way. I know that sounds kind of corny, but um, the more that I drew Opal and the more that I saw saw the dialogue for and her interaction with Ryan and Brad and everything and Quinn, um, she was just I just we just fell in love with her. She's just so sweet. And, um, she just became, I mean, she just became, you know, I think a character that, that Chuck and I just kind of fell in love with just because how, just how sweet she was. She's just such a great character. And so I think that, that kind of, I think even when I did, um, my first, uh, drawing of her, I did the character sketches I did for the, for the, for the cast. I think the first time I drew her, um, she's got the glasses on, but I put her hands in her pocket. Mm. kind of like where she's full where she's not she's not going to be the she's not going to like you know is you know doesn't want the spotlight stand out in the crowd kind of thing she's a little bit more shy a little bit more introverted and so that's just kind of how the character kind of developed so it became easy at that point you you do mention um we've mentioned a few times the character of quinn so i guess there is some spoilers here so i'm hoping people have read this issue because uh, <laughs> i'm going to be spoiling some of it but um with a character like Quinn, I mean, obviously it's very important that you, you that you uh, get a certain visual style because we have to want we we have to love this kid at least like yeah. that's my read from the first issue like it doesn't work if we don't love this kid so was that like what was the process for you to develop the kid to make sure it was going to elicit the right re- reader response? 
Well, I'll let Chuck do that one because I don't remember. Because really, in my original idea, there wasn't a Quinn. That was yeah. Chuck's idea. Was <laughs> oh, awesome. really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, I just had a first page in my head. If they're seeing this interview, if they're listening to this interview, they should make sure they're seeing this page this whole time. So. So, Chuck, are you able to speak up just a bit? There's a bit of a, a, like a background noise when you do speak, so sometimes you go into a lower register and then I can't quite hear you. Oh, okay, sure. Um, sorry. I got, I got, uh, Quinn is um, – how's that? Can you hear me better? That is better, yes. So, you know what? Actually, I should have checked this before we get started. Um, audio and video settings. Sometimes it doesn't go through the microphone. It's going through the computer speaker. Sorry if I'm, I'm pausing. I'm going to That's okay. Some weird time here. But, uh, but I will say that uh, that while while Chuck's doing that, Chuck and Bino, you know, he said he envisioned the first couple of pages, and there was a Quinn relationship. And my first envisioning of it, there were teenagers being murdered in a car. So it's a little <laughs> different kind of a vibe. So, but I I like Chuck's version better. So, and um, in fact, I love the first the way the first issue starts with the two of them. And um, you know, going down to the basement, and you know everything that you know obviously occurs after that. But that that relationship, um, um, I think, is important for Ryan and Quinn. But all, I think that relationship informs Ryan more than anything else, mm. and um, you know, gives a different kind of a, a a level to Ryan that I certainly had never imagined when when you know I when I was originally thinking of this idea. Um, so I think it was great, and I think that that allows then Quinn's interaction with Opal informs Opal. Um, and, um, but that relationship with Ryan and Quinn adds a, la- adds a layer to Ryan and to all the interactions that I had never, I had never considered before. Hmm. Yeah. When we, it's one of the weird things about, how's the sound? Is that better? It's a little bit better. It's, there's still a lot of background noise for some reason, only when you speak. Ah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Um, the, uh, use your active voice. My my outdoor voice. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, when uh, when Pat and I were first uh, pitching this idea, we actually pitched the third issue first. Mm. It was so uh, so some of the stuff that happened in that third issue, we came up with a bunch of things. I kind of wanted to drop everybody sort of in the middle of it when we were first starting, but then I, I realized no, we kind of got to go back and set this up a little bit better. So. Uh, we uh, we went back and did the first two issues to kind of lead into the third issue and the fourth issue and the fourth one. But uh, in that first issue, yeah, there's a scene. There's a completely different scene that starts it off. And when we went back and did the original, I thought, I want to start this off in a creepier way. And I thought of the Quinn thing. And, and then I realized that Ryan was so isolated that if Quinn stays around... He's, it's like his only friend. It's kind of, it's, it's almost a little like sad that Ryan has kind of isolated himself so much from the rest of the world that his only buddy is, 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 is dead. And uh, so that's where the idea for Quinn came from, is that uh, it, it helped me to have, it was sort of a writing device where it gave me somebody for, for Ryan to talk to. And then I, I started getting excited again, but I saw Pat draw. There was this, the one drawing where uh, Ryan is talking to Opal and Quinn is there next to him and he's making those little faces and stuff and I thought oh my god this is so awesome I gotta I, Quinn's gotta stay around forever he's gonna be my favorite character so uh, so yeah so I mean it was it, it, you'll see you'll see there's you know, a whole lot of reasons for Quinn to still stay around some of that just again it, it develops as Pat and I are working together and just beat up it happened on Edgewood too he drew this one background bartender it just looks so cool and interesting. I gave him a name, and we started writing <laughs> scenes for him, and we gave him a personality. So, uh, it just it, it happens all the time. Uh, really, like it. that's one of the things that I like about this process is that it's so unlike what I do in television. Mm. Everything has to be approved. When it gets approved, it's locked in. 
and then it's eight months before you see the stuff that comes back and you're like, oh, this is what we're going to do. Whereas Pat and I were just, we're always adjusting on the fly. You know, it's like, it's like uh, uh, Kobe, Kobe and LeBron. You know, we're just like <laughs> across the floor and doing our thing. <laughs> yeah, and sometimes we get ourselves in trouble, though. We do. We do. Uh, <laughs> Some, someday we'll tell you about the trouble. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get myself into it's really my fault. <laughs> now, one thing we talked extensively about in the past with both of you, uh, sp- specifically with you, Pat, um, has been how, as you did more work on Edge World, because it was again designed to be a comicsology exclusive, um, that you right. learned how to really break things down as panel turns instead of page turns, and this feels like. Um, maturation of everything that you learned on Edge World, because the vibe is so different and it is more horror based. And so now being able to have so many of these panel turns is really yep. like really works um, because it helps escalate, you know, the uh, the sense of doom and also just some of the pacing of the scenes really works for having guided view because your your eyes are more are more patient. Um, so you're kind of soaking in each panel as opposed to a traditional just page where you do kind of scan. And so it really benefits from this kind of slow burn and going panel by panel. I'm just curious for you, Chuck, knowing how Pat's been able to evolve his own skills and, and make sure that all these panel turns work, how much harder is it for you to make sure that every panel does have a little bit more juice to it so that he can really bring this to life and, and create more suspense? You know, it's not, it, it, for me, it's not really that hard. Pat and I have talked about this a lot, actually. That's part of the process, because when when we work in animation, we we pitch the storyboards this way, one image mm-hmm. at a time. So, and so we're used to setting up that image being the most that it can be, the punchiest that it can be, and that when you get to the next image, it's a surprise, so that you find out. Because you really want to gauge audience reaction. You want to see how they're going to respond to... A line of dialogue or, or a punchline, how it lands, and, and, it's, and as a process in animation, it's been one of the greatest tools that we've come up with. So we used to pin it all. It used to be like a comic book page. We would go and pin it all up to a wall, and it used to piss me off because people would go and around and look at all your boards and spoil all your jokes and, and ruin all your suspenseful moments. It was kind of like watching people thumb through comics in a comic book shop. You know? It drove me crazy. Um, <laughs> This is actually much, for me, this is a much more natural way to go. Pat has um, really adapted to it. And, and, and in a way, it's, it's sort of unfortunate because he does amazing page layouts. When he's got a full <laughs> page to work with, they're beautiful. He does the characters break the panel borders and stuff, but, but he, we, we sort of sat on him and made him really, you know, stay in this like square or rectangular <laughs> format. But it, it just, what it does for me is it just brings out all that stuff that we've been talking about. It brings out those expressions and the subtlety. There's a couple of compositions and a couple of issues that have come up and tormented that I, I, I've been joking, they give me PTSD because it's like, it's <laughs> like, you know, being back there when my dad was pissed off at me and, and uh, it's just these images that he drew and the way they're composed is just amazing. Uh, so, so it, it, it was something that I think it was, it was much easier for me and every little harder for Pat, but boy, he, he adjusted to it. He's a male. And I love Guided View. Right? Yeah, but obviously, if you, you've read this issue, so you know that there's a, you know, just like in the first issue of Edge World, there's a, there's a surprise cliffhanger that you don't see coming. If you watch reading it in Guided View, it's a much better idea than it is if you're looking at it page format. So, uh, I love it. I yeah, I think the panel to panel thing too is just it, it. I think it just, um, you know, the 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 no overlapping panels and the grid panel layout. Certainly, obviously, that's that's not unique to, to what we're doing. With it's it's, it's a, you know, a comic book storytelling staple um, for decades. But uh, um, there is a there is a a you enjoy to there's some there's some fun in getting to play around. With the panel, with the page layouts, um, where you try to lead the, the reader's eye and all that kind of and that kind of stuff. But uh, um, there is some, something more, and it's you know when Chuck mentioned the storyboard thing, they're just going from panel to panel to panel to panel, and you just basically use each, each panel almost like as a screen, TV screen, movie screen. It does lend itself more, I think, to a more cinematic feel to it, um, and I don't necessarily mean cinematic. 
back in the way where a panel was necessarily some kind of expansive um, uh, backgrounds or something that would be like would look huge on the big screen. I mean, I mean, cinematic in the way um, the, the the reader absorbs the story, if that makes any mm-hmm. sense. So um, I do think there's a benefit to, to telling stories this way. And I will adjust the dialogue after I get back uh, past pages, because he's still drawing on his, his comic book pages, when, when they come back. As fast as I can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but when he when I get the pages back, I'll adjust the dialogue. I'll move a line to make the to make his his artwork hit visually first. So the line of dialogue that I had on I'll move it to the next panel, or I'll just delete it entirely. Because sometimes it, it'll all be there and gone. So, so we're constantly making adjustments to try to make it more readable and more impactful. So mm-hmm. some people are both really focused on it. We really want to. And we, we always sort of joke that, we, well, how did it read? Did it read good? <laughs> we give it to his sister. His sister is like our beta tester. <laughs> you know, if she reads it, likes it, we figure, okay, we nailed it. We got it. She doesn't read comics. She's not a comics person. So. What I find so interesting about the guided view is that, especially as you do different types of layouts on the page, Pat, is that, like, for example, speaking of, like, the last page that has that kind of reveal, that you're like, whoa, wait, what? Um, yeah, when, yeah. That, when that happens, the first two panels on the page are, you know, you're, you're kind of more standard kind of size. And so the way that it kind of fits on the screen is obviously a little bit larger, almost like it's zoomed in on it. So you have those two scenes, i uh, sorry, two panels, and then the next panel with that kind of reveal the bloody reveal, so to speak, <laughs> it's now almost like it's on a widescreen for a moment because you have right. white bars on each side because of the orientation. And I think it actually works because it makes it more impactful. It kind of stretches the image, but makes it more like, no, you got to look at this. Um, and it's yeah. just an interesting cinematic way. And then, you know, you, it, I was actually even looking at how many pages you have this. Some of them are bigger moments, some of them aren't. Like, as I said before, when Brad kind of storms in with, the, with his crew, that's one of these kind of larger widescreen moments as compared right. to the scenes immediately preceding it. So it's interesting to see how you manipulate that. And again, I did not see that reveal coming. It was a really awesome reveal. Definitely <laughs> made me go back and be like, well, hold on, what? Like, it was really fascinating because you don't expect it. This, the setup with Angela feels very, like, we've seen this before. Like, it's, it's a way of having a character express things in a way that, especially as an isolated character, he can't, but you don't want to have just internal dialogue. So instead, you right. do have you know, this way of him speaking to someone else. So it's really fascinating to see how that works out. Yeah, and I think that's the advantage there is, like I said, I know we were, we did, did it in uh, in the first issue of Edgeworld, too, where, you know, obviously when this comes out as a trade, I think it'll be impactful as well because it is the final page of the first issue. You're not going to necessarily see it coming. But there is, in guided view, by, by having a more measured way you're absorbing each, each panel, um, you do get a chance to play around with reveals more. And, you know, uh, uh, I just think it worked really well, both in this issue and the first issue of Edgeworld. What I also appreciate, and I'm curious who, I guess, obviously this would have been a Chuck thing, but I wondered on how many levels you're trying to make this work. Um, When you have that reveal and then you have the last panel of the issue, and it's um, it's just Angela saying, same time next week, which I felt very much like, like it felt very TV oriented like that. Like that, that, like that's the thing, right? You want to have someone come back next week or next issue, or whatever the case might be. So I like that kind of little bit of dialogue because that just definitely felt like that because it's like, Oh, we've given you a cliffhanger. You're coming back, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank well, you. Yeah. So, I mean, I, it, right, that, both, and then, those are the things that are uh, in the back the of our regular head. <laughs> yes, it's like a, it's it's. I like di- lines of dialogue that work on multiple levels. So <laughs> now, so for you, Pat. So, what is it like? I mean, well, actually, for really, this is for both of you. Um, when you do have the final kind of final panel turn of the issue, and that's where you're kind of leaving it on. Um, is there any back and forth about you know what's the most impactful way to leave the issue or? You know, was there any back and forth, or was it pretty much like, no, this is the most unsettling way for us to do this? <laughs> well, that was up to that was up to yeah, that was up to Chuck. I mean, we really didn't have a discussion about how the way the the, the issue was going to end, to, to, to my memory. I mean, it was uh, um, you know, we had talked about a bunch of story points, but that piece of it, that was Chuck's idea about how to end the first issue. When I read it, I just was I was thrilled. I said, oh my god, yeah, this is great. This will be enough to. Uh, 
pique people's interest and uh, kind of shock them a little bit, get them to come back for the next issue. But I don't remember necessarily, Chuck, you and I sitting down and and deciding that that would be the way to kind of go out on the end of the first issue. I think that I think you just kind of had that in the script, and um, I think that was you. Yeah, there, I mean, sometimes sometimes there are things that Pat and I will discuss and you know, we'll, we'll work it out, or you know, I'll send him a version of the script. And I think we can do this better. And, but sometimes I just want to surprise him. I want to get his reaction. And this was, this, I think he's right. I think this was one of those where I sent it without us discussing it, without him knowing what was coming. I just wanted to see how he responded, and he loved it. So, but then, you know, he always takes it another step. So, there, uh, I, without spoiling it, the, he did some things with the with the image to make it even more unsettling. Uh, um, and I, I don't know how to describe it without really spoiling it. Right. <laughs> yeah, because uh, I think in the in the script there was a certain there was a certain um, how do I yeah there's a certain uh, um, I, I don't know how, how to say it without giving anything away. I know there's it's hard. A certain level of let's just say there's a certain level of commitment to that moment. <laughs> that was at one level in the script, and I did try to kind of push it a little bit further. And succeeded. <laughs> now, I think that final page, especially, I mean, is helped by the amazing colors by Lee Larridge, who we haven't really mentioned at this point. But I mean, yep. that that blood splatter is the just the right tone, if that sounds yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, we no. knew that. Yeah, I mean, from working with Lee on Edge World, um, we knew he was the guy to give the right mood and feel to torment it. I mean, and that's what I think that's his that's the thing that he brings to every project and certainly in the projects that we've worked on together is that, <coughs> excuse me, he has this ability to create um, mood and create environment um, that is just amazing. I mean, it, it works so well at Edgeworld and then you get, you know, science fiction western. Now you're going over to something more paranormal horror. But the, his, the way he approaches the pages, the way he approaches his color choices, um, um, we knew it would be perfect for, for the Torment, and it certainly has proven to be the case. Um, um, you know, each issue is better than the last. I mean, he's amazing. We're very lucky to have him on board. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a four-person team. You know? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and Lee both bring so much to it. Jody gives up. Like, you know, she did a great job on Edge World, but you, you never know if... if People can sort of switch genres, but she sent us some horror stuff for the titles that were just amazing, really subtle and wonderful. And, uh, yeah, and that opening, that opening page, that opening, I guess the title page, or that's the tormented, and and she put in the like like, like the TV graphic yeah. with the little like the little channel dial, the channel dial changer thing, and uh, uh, it was I just I loved that absolutely, it was so perfect. Yeah, she did a great job. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll bring the kudos all Speaking of the uh, the beginning of the issue, um, whose idea was it to have the uh, the chipped world's greatest dad mug on the first page? That was Chuck. Yeah, that was a weird last minute decision. Actually, that was that was not a part of the original script. Um, I don't remember what made me decide. I think it was because uh, part of it was because we were we were we were trying things with the issue and I think both of us I want you know like I want Pat's original idea did not have sort of the abusive father thing and I, right. I I went with that because I was looking for I'm a huge Stephen King fan and mm. it's a, exactly what Pat was talking about in the interview where you have just average everyday people dealing with horrific situations that are that feel even more horrific because because they're just normal. They're just average, real people dealing with these things. There's nothing, nothing paranormal or crazy about it. Uh, I often say that, that, the, uh, that I, I love the book, it, but my favorite parts by far are the stories of the kids in the town. And mm. Dealing with their personal lives and their situations and how they interacted with each other and how they interacted with their parents and their families. And, and, uh, and so I, we, were, we were sort of testing and trying things, and I think we've done already some of the work on issue one before I went back and I said, you know what, I think I want to do a splash page with this weird poem. Mm. That goes, yeah. 
Come home, we have to do a cup. <laughs> <laughs> that was certainly a deadline saver. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was going to yeah. say, so, so Pat, do you have a, a chipped mug somewhere that used as reference for this? <laughs> uh, no, actually, I don't. But I, because it, it did work so well, and it was a time saver, I'm, I am going to suggest uh, uh, to Chuck that we do an all silverware issue. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> that would be great for me. I um I know I know we're we're running short on time, but one one thing I did want to bring up and mention, which I re- again I, I kind of mentioned it before, but I really really appreciated it. One I did like the, I loved the opening with Angela. I thought it was a great way to immediately get into the into the main character's mind. But I again, as I said, I loved it more with the reveal at the end because it did make me go back and it did a, it changed a lot of how some of it played, which is obviously how it works, right? Because when you have yeah. um, Ryan asking like if I you know. If I do that, then maybe next time we can talk about you. And she goes, "Oh, that's not that's not how this works." And you're like, "Oh, obviously, because she's a you know she's a therapist or whatever she is." And then you get to the end, you're like, "Oh, like that's <laughs> right. that's what was going on here," which was fascinating because it works on so many level on the, both those levels, and you don't even think anything of it because it seems so natural. And yet, there's a lot going on that you didn't know. Yeah, absolutely. Very nice of you to say. I'm glad you picked up on that because that stuff is really important to us. We want we it, go, having people who want to go back and reread it and pick something else up the second time through is obviously it's a higher value. Thing. So I always want to do something like that. Like that. So I have a small question, and this is, I love little odd things that show up in, in books, so I'm very curious about this one. When Ryan is, is uh, after he's bolted the door, and he's sitting down to just kind of try and relax as much as he can, he sits there, <laughs> and he's reading Quantum Mechanics for Dummies, so who's the, whose idea was that? Was that yours, Pat? No, that was Chuck. That was, in this script. That was so funny, but that was Chuck's idea. I thought that was great. <laughs> well, that's funny. No, I gotta say, so I love, I mean, it gets, it's almost like a three panel gag, but I did love that first shot just of him in the room and the ambience. Like, there's just so much character in there, and especially, again, with Guided View having it blown up that way, um, it really adds, and it reminds me of how good, not just a, a character actor you are in terms of how you portray your characters, but also just the set dressing, because, and that's something in Edge World, you were playing with a blank canvas and you really brought that world to life and you could feel it even though you, you know, obviously weren't on Edge World. And that same thing is very true here. It definitely felt like a very lived in room. It didn't feel like just kind of a stock image because it didn't feel like you were, you know, uh, it was, didn't feel like a deadline buster. It did feel like you spent time <laughs> developing this space. Right. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think that is, um, I mean, really that's just part of what I enjoy about comics and and that kind of storytelling is to um you want to create a a world no matter if it's if it's edge world or tormented or spider girl or you just want to make sure that when because that's what i remember loving when i was uh when i was a comics fan reading them as a kid that not only did i love the stories the dialogue and all the character interactions but I also liked being able to look, not only absorb that story in that way, but also you look at the panels and you feel like you're in that world. I mean, isn't that, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing is trying is to give the reader a chance to kind of lose themselves into the world that we're creating and have them kind of, we take them on this journey of this story. And so, yeah, that's, that's part of the things that I love about this, this kind of, this medium is that getting a chance to create a world visually that looks um, that looks real, like you said, that looks lived in, which I love that line. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Is that uh, uh, and the same thing with with Ryan? I did a lot of research on, on um, uh, what I thought would look what, what the you know you, you know we you, you, this big house that his dad owned and that had the room in it. So there was this kind of gothic nature to it. So you start looking at certain types of architecture that works out my. My wife's an interior designer, so she had access to a lot of reference. And th- so you just start building the world from there. Either it's, you know, on another planet or it's in the world that we, you know, we live in today. But you do want to try to create that world where somebody just falls into it and just, boom, they just feel like they have been there the whole time. That's obviously what works with horror as well, right? The more comfortable you are, the, the more startling oh, yeah. it is when you kind of Absolutely. When you pull out the rug from under you. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think that was a big, that was an important piece of this, for sure. 
So and one thing I'm curious about for you, Pat, and I, I don't know, obviously, your exact timelines of when you were working on which issues, et cetera. But at uh, some point, I'm you trying working, as fast as I can. <laughs> was there a point at which you were you were kind of rotating between working on The Tormented and also doing, you know, hoo-ha Spider-Man action in Marvel Super Heroes Secret Wars? Yeah, there well, it, there was some overlap so that that once we kind of got started on on, on Tormented, and then some outside forces kind of came to play and we had to kind of put it on the shelf for a little while. There was a period of time where um, um, while I was working on Secret World's Battle World, um, there was a little bit of overlap. And, but part of that was also, um, even though we didn't have a plan necessarily for uh, like a true deadline to finish Tormented, um we knew we were going to finish it. So Chuck and I would talk on the side. I remember drawing um, like loose layouts of pages and sending them to Chuck um, just between the two of us. And that was while, yeah, I was working on uh, Secret Wars. And then um, once kind of uh, Tormented came back to life and we knew that we were going to be able to finish the series, um, that all happened while I was finishing up Star Wars, uh, the Toronto Alliance's book for Marvel. So there was some overlap at the end there too, you know, which goes back to the, you know, the, my previous comment is I, I, I may have to give up sleep, but, um, <laughs> so there was, there was some, a little overlap, but really it, it, and actually it timed out pretty well in terms of, you know, tormented had to take a, had to take a, a little hiatus. In the meantime, I had these other projects come in mm-hmm. and then right about the time tormented was ready to get back, uh, get going again, um, uh, that, came pretty close to when I was finishing up the Star Wars thing. So they're really, it kind of timed that okay. So I'm glad that uh, they didn't bleed over in your art and we didn't suddenly see Hobgoblin with his head being cleaved in. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, there wasn't, yeah, there's no like, you know, uh, Ewoks in the back of a Tormented page or anything. <laughs> I mean, that would be a fun little uh, Easter egg now. <laughs> sure, but I would get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you have to alter them just enough. Right, right, right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, they did that in the old school Thundercats show. They had like these like, <laughs> robotic characters who were essentially Ewoks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so I'll let you guys go in just a moment. I guess the big thing is uh, how many issues are there going to be of the Tormented? I don't think I saw that in the press release. We've got five for the first arc, and uh, we haven't gotten official word on the second arc, but uh, I think that will all depend on how well it does. Do you like this kind of season format you guys have been doing? I mean, obviously you did with Edgeworld first, and the first one did well enough to warrant a second. And then I hope to God there's going to be a third one, because, again, cliffhanger. Um, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you don't leave uh, Tormented off on a cliffhanger as well after the first the five issues. <laughs> uh, we don't want to, no. I mean, that's not the plan. So um, I mean, no spoilers or anything. It's just season open. But it, there's, there's room to continue, I can say that. Okay. Do you, do, are you guys uh, thinking about when Edgeworld Season 3 will start work on it, or is there already been work ahead, or are you not able to talk about it? I think we can talk about it. I don't think it, nope. we, uh, yeah, I think we can, it. too. Uh, yeah, I think that will be all right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're going to roll right into it since we're done with Tormented, which is uh, uh, about another month and a half, two months. So, really? Since, I mean, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Did, as someone who has had, you know, der, um, long runs throughout their history in the comic book industry, I'm curious how you feel about kind of jumping in and out and doing like five issues here and then doing a four issue miniseries of Marvel and then doing, you know, the Star Wars stuff. And then like, do you like kind of parachuting in and out of the different projects or do you miss kind of having a longer sustained run so you can kind of flex your muscles, get maybe a little too comfortable at times, but also being able to kind of know it's going to be the same kind of visual style and the same creator. Like, how do you feel kind of going from like being a bit more of a mercenary, although thankfully edge world and, um, and the tormented are, you know, creator owned. So it's not the same idea because at least you're working on something for you. Right. But in general, how do you feel about kind of going around and doing the multiple projects versus kind of having a sustained run like you did on spotter girl, like you did on untold tales of Spider-Man, et cetera. Well, I think, you know, the, the, well, I mean, the cop out answer is that there's, there's, there's good things to both methods. I mean, um, and part, part of it is obviously is the project. So like you said, hopping back and forth between, even though they're different genres, 
hopping back and forth between Edge World and Tormented is easy to do because they're worlds and they're characters that Chuck and I created. Mm -hmm. So that makes the transition easier. Um, but then as far as like, like jumping over to it, it, part of it depends on the project. So jumping on to Star Wars Battle World, Battle World with Tom DeFalco, that was great because that's, I mean, I've worked with Tom um, for years and I worked with him in the beginning of my career and that kind of straightforward superhero story is I love doing. Uh, um, and then jumping into Star Wars, I was a longtime Star Wars fan. First time I drew Star Wars, uh, a Star Wars project. That was so fun because you get to draw these characters that you're a fan of. So part of it is that um, adrenaline rush of, um, wow, this is great project. And then, oh, wait a minute, this is also a great project. And you kind of jump around, um, you know, if the, if the projects aren't fun or they're like pulling teeth, then obviously it's not as, it's not as enjoyable. Um, but um, at the same time. But they're time, also short, I guess. Um, and and, and um, I guess that's the only. I just, it just can't. It, it can't. What's that? I was going to say, at least if it was uncomfortable or wasn't quite jiving, at least it's relatively short if you're doing these kind of quick steps. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. And I think, but I think that there is something to be said for, um, I mean, when I was a kid collecting comics, that was what I liked to, you know, I, I, I liked the fact that each month I, I knew that a specific writer or artist were going to be there every month telling the stories of these characters that I loved. And, and there is some, there is a, a great uh, value to and enjoyment in doing a long run on a book where you basically live in that world every month and you get to play around. I think you then you get to play around with things more subtly too. You can play the longer game where, where you can kind of hint at things that happen later in the series. Um, so, uh, like I said, you know, I'm taking the cop out answer, which is that there are, there are value and there are positives to both, uh, both methods. I guess the, the last question I have, and I, I think I've asked you guys this before, but again, now that you're working on another creator owned, um, you know, does it feel like, I mean, you obviously both cut your teeth and worked on, you know, um, comics from the big two, working on someone else's projects. And now again, you get to own and can kind of control your own. Um, how, just how satisfying is that to you both? You want to go first or me? You can go first. Okay. <laughs> I just I just shot I just shot my face off for like two minutes, so I figured you know I think the people would, the people would enjoy a break from me yapping. Okay. Um, I, honestly, there's there's nothing like it. You know, there, you, when you're when people first approach you and they say, "Hey, you want to write the X Men?" and you go, "Wow, yeah, I think I would like to write the X Men." You know, it's sort of fun. It's like it's the, it's the toys that you always wanted to play with. It's like Pat was talking about just a few minutes ago. And it's a blast. You have a great time doing it, but but you know you're 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 working on somebody else's characters. They're they're not the way that you might have created them based on continuity and, and, and you're trying to stay true to things. So you know, as, as much as fans think you just blow off continuity, you really don't. You, know, you research it as much as you can afford to, because <laughs> it's not like Marvel provides you with the, the research material. So. Um, so there, there's just there's always that sort of downside that work for higher side and I would write a script and I would send it in and they'd say oh we love it and that would be enough you know but Pat and I when we work on these books together we talk about every detail we talk about and and then I'll go back I and I I can't I, I do this professionally because you get nice and get to do something but we revise and change and alter and rework stuff because. We just, we can just come up with a better idea and we want to do it and we can, and, and it matters to us. So even like when Pat's talking about, like, it, all that detail and stuff that he puts into the background and, and the, the worlds that he establishes, I love that. Don't get me wrong. I think it's beautiful, but I'm always telling him, you know, you can pull the camera in closer. <laughs> you can, you can draw fewer background characters. I, I feel okay with it. And, and he doesn't, you know. I, I send him something and I'll say, you know, uh, oh, there's like you know, a few people in here and you can see a couple of people in the background. And then he sends me this street scene from Edgeworld. It's like all these different kinds of aliens with hoses coming out of them and weird stuff that they're writing on it. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. So, and, and I do the same thing with the writing. I go back and ah, the dialogue isn't working for me. i got to rework this and I'll rework that. And Pat, the, the version of the script that, that sees print is nothing like the first draft of the script. That no. First and, 
And and it's and it, nobody's making us do it. The editor is fine with it. Everybody's fine with it. But we just we're always wanting to do it and make it better. Pat will call me up and go, I really love the script, but this one scene really bugged me. Like, oh yeah, you're right. It's not a good scene. I got to that. <laughs> so you know, so we'll, we're we're we constantly feed off of each other to just improve and to do better. You know? And so we're working way harder on them than you would think that we would need to, but. At the same time, we're out. I'm enjoying it more. I think that is too. I just love this. It's scary. You're out on that tight wire because these are all characters you've created. They're all situations you've created. If somebody says, yeah, I don't really like that. You can't just blow it off and say, eh, that's Marvel's character. <laughs> but, you know, these are ours. The, and, and, you know, one of my best friends called me up and he says, God, I don't know how to tell you this, but I really hate Edgeworld. And I was like, it was devastating to me. And I, you know, I thought, wow, why do you hate it? He goes, it just, it just doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. You start off, you're talking to the psychic, and then you're in space. <laughs> and then it, it's like, you know, you just wanted something really grounded and very Star Trek. And just, this wasn't it. So, mm. uh, so, but that stuff hits you harder. So, you know, you go back and you reread it. You could have made it better. Nah, he's just crazy. My friend is just crazy. But, but it matters. It really matters. Whereas if somebody comes up to me and says, I hated what you did with Juggernaut, it's like, oh, who cares? They changed it back as soon as I was gone. Why are you so mad at me? <laughs> so, so that's that. I don't know. That, I think that over answers your question, but it's just as fun as it can be working at Marvel and DC. And I love writing Superman and Justice League and all that. All these characters. God, when Pat, and Pat called me up to, to do this, I never realized how awesome it was going to be. We were just having the time to write this. Yeah, I think that's I think that that's exactly it. I mean, you just have your you have a chance to, uh, like Chuck said, it's certainly it was a blast to draw Spider Man or Darth Vader, and I love drawing all those characters. Um, but this is different. I mean, this is just something that you create on your own. Um, you don't there are there are, you don't answer to anybody. It's just, you're kind of your own. You put your own imprint on it, both as a as a writer and an artist, and you put it out in the world, and that is that is a scarier proposition because um, you know Spider Man, the X Men, Star Wars, they have a fan base that's going to be there reading the book, whether you're on it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, but you, you put your you put your own ideas and your own characters and your own uh, creativity out there, and there's a good chance there's just really a chance that no one's going to like it. Um, so, but, but the reward in doing, we have to take that chance, you know, I mean, I mean, if it, if you can find a connection with an audience, um, you just can't beat it. I mean, that's just the best thing that there is. It's interesting hearing Chuck speak and all I could feel was PTSD from X-Men and I'm just like, oh my God, (laughs) I I almost felt bad. You could have your your own podcast just for that. Good, yeah. I can talk about it for weeks. Well, again, thank you both so much for for coming in to uh, to chat about this. And it's funny we didn't end up really talking about Edge World season two only because the tormented is the you know the the shiny new thing. But uh, that is the new thing, right? It's it's quite a shiny new thing. Um, it's something I again I really enjoyed reading it today. Um, right. it, it was actually it was really funny because obviously last week. Pat, seeing you hype up, like, there's an announcement coming, and then <laughs> you, you drop this announcement, and by the way, first issue's on Tuesday. I'm like, oh my god, already? Like, that's, <laughs> that was a quick turnaround, but it was uh, exciting. So as you said, it was kind of perfect timing that we were all set to have a conversation today, and we actually get to go uh, deep into this issue. So I really appreciate uh, both of you taking the time. Oh, Adam, it was all, it's always a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Yes, thanks, Adam. We really enjoy it. Have a great night, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, Adam. You too. All right.